Hey everyone, it is Tuesday, October 29, and right now we're going to tell you everything you need to know about Apple's latest version of OS X, Mavericks. This is an iMore Special Edition. Peter Cohen, how are you? Good, how are you, sir? Good, you survived Mavericks. I did indeed. <laughs> and you put together one hell of a, of a review. Congratulations on that. Thank you very much. So, um, I want to kind of go through the review and, you know, for people who prefer to listen or prefer to watch, sort of give them a sense of Mavericks. But the thing that struck me right away, and we saw it at WWDC, is after joking about sea lions briefly, Apple made a pretty radical departure. They retired the big cats. We did not get Sabretooth or something like that. And they switched to California places. Was there any special symbolism attached to that for you? Well, you know, <clears throat> I think when when um, uh, uh, Craig Fe Federighi announced the name change, he said that they were going for places that inspired them. Um, and Mavericks uh, is a surf spot that's right off the coast um, of Northern California near Half Moon Bay. Um, it's only about a 45-minute drive from the Cupertino campus, so it's pretty nearby. Um, I don't get the sense that there's anything about Mavericks specifically that, that – uh, sort of carried over to the operating system. But it's not a Top Gun reference? It's not a Top Gun reference, as much as we might like to uh, think of Tom Cruise, you know, grinning and shooting us a thumbs up as he flies by. Cupertino Tower. That's right. Um, but, um, uh, you know, it's it, 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 it helps pave the way for um, Apple's um, uh, future... Uh, OS 10 names because let's face it, there are a lot more uh, place names in California that one could consider for inspiration than there are big cats left in the world that Apple hasn't already exploited. We were joking at Singleton. I think Whiska started it off with uh, OS 10 point tenderloin. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, mine was Compton. <laughs> South Central Syndicate. All right. Um, so the pricing is really interesting, and we just found that out last week. Uh, Mavericks is free, and last night, in fact, uh, Tim Cook and Peter Oppenheimer on Apple's conference call suggested that not only was Mavericks free, but that OS updates would be free going forward in the future. That's a pretty – even Apple, who'd driven their price down to 20 bucks, that's still a fundamental change in their model. That is a very fundamental change in their model, and let's face it, Apple has been ratcheting down the price, as you noted, um, of um, uh, um, of of the Mac operating system for a while now. It used to be, uh, you know, one hundred and twenty nine dollars. Even then, it was priced very competitively against what Microsoft was doing, uh, but it was a big nut for a lot of people to pay, and um, the adoption rate showed it. You know, the the, the adoption rates were much slower then. You know, then uh, Apple lowered it to $20, and that got a lot of people moving on board. Well, Mavericks is free, and, you know, I think the danger that Apple has with that is, um, you know, the same danger that we see in the Mac App Store. When people don't pay anything uh, for something, they tend to undervalue it. And I've seen uh, a lot of undervaluing so far from other reviewers and from some users who really kind of discount a lot of the real fundamental changes that Mavericks has that I think are very, very important. I absolutely want to get to those, but sort of the last thing I wanted to ask you about was compatibility because they made a big deal about just how far back you could go to install Mavericks, and unlike some you know previous years, you didn't have to step your way up into it. You could just make a giant leap. That's exactly right. Um, you know, basically any machine that's been built within the past six years or so should be able to run Mavericks without too much of a problem. Mavericks is compatible with any 64-bit capable Mac that also has a 64-bit EFI. Um, so that excludes like early, like first generation Mac Pros, and uh, obviously Power Mac G5s wouldn't run it, even though they're technically 64-bit machines. If you have machines. a Bondi Blue iMac, you are out of you luck. are out of luck, exactly. But um, uh, you know, if if you've got a machine, um, and and I've got it listed in the review, um, all the machines that I that I'm aware of specifically that are compatible, there's that that is capable of running Mountain Lion, you will definitely be able to run Mavericks. And the interesting thing is, because Apple's made it free, they basically said, look, you don't have to step through Lion, Mountain Lion uh, to get Mavericks. As long as you've got Snow Leopard installed on your machine, 
10.67 or 10.68, because those are the two versions that actually have the Mac App Store built into them, uh, you will be able to get Mavericks for free, and you can leapfrog, which means the people who, you know, maybe didn't want to pay for an operating system upgrade um, before uh, when Lion or Mountain Lion came out, but still have a machine that's running uh, Snow Leopard and, and that's capable of running Mavericks, they can make the jump. I think that's pretty impressive. I think that's phenomenal. And if you know, if you paid all your money for that hardware and couldn't afford the twenty bucks for Mountain Lion, now, you know, you waited a year, but you got it for free. Absolutely. All right, so let's, I mean, since we're superficial people, let's scratch the surface and look for more surface. The UI interface, it did not change anywhere nearly as much as iOS 7 did uh, on the iPhone and iPad side, but it had a little bit of that Snow Leopard feel to me, a little bit of that cleaning up and polishing off. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think that this goes back to what I was saying before, where, you know, some people are saying, where's the beef in this? Because they're not seeing a lot of fundamental UI changes. Uh, there are a few things that I think are very smart in Mavericks that, um, that are new, like um, uh, tabbed finder windows, I think, are long overdue. As a matter of fact, that's been the purview of... Um, uh, third-party utilities that you could add on to the uh, to, to 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 OS X's Finder for years now, uh, but this makes um, Finder windows work the exact same way that they do in Safari, for example. So uh, you hit Command T and you create a new tabbed window. It makes it much easier um, to to move files. Uh, between different parts of your hard disk or look for different things. You can set up each um, tab however you want. So if you want one to be a list and one to be icons, you can do that. Um, it, it's, it's a very smart feature, and it, it's, a, it's a nice productivity enhancer. And I think that, that this is really kind of the hallmark of what Mavericks is all about. Mavericks isn't as flashy as, let's say, an iOS 7 update is. Um, but it fundamentally takes what's there and makes it more efficient to use um, and increases your product productivity in the process. And I think that that's very, very important. Now, um, Apple's made a big deal about uh, going back to the Mac recently. We, know, we all know iOS spawned from OS X, and it, used a, it leveraged a lot of the technologies from the Mac to make the original iPhone. And then a couple of years ago, Apple made a big deal about taking everything that they'd learned from making the iPhone, like QuickTime 10 and other things, and bringing it back to the Mac. And one of the things they did was unify app names like contacts, uh, but they also uh, unified a lot of elements like launch center looks or launch pad looks sort of like springboard and the interfaces looked very similar and it, it was their hope that people who were used to an iPad or an iPhone would feel more comfortable on OS 10 and now that iOS has changed but OS 10 hasn't do you think there's any risk of a disconnect to halo shoppers looking to get into the Mac for the first time I think there is, and I think that Apple will address that as time goes on. You know, it's it's unquestionable that Apple is going to evolve the look and feel of Mavericks a little bit, or the look and feel of OS X um, a little bit going forward. But, you know, a major UI rework like it did with iOS 7, I'm not sure is in the cards. However, I do think that, you know, that, that Mavericks is... Um, suffering from a little bit of interface exhaustion. Um, OS X in general is suffering from a little bit of interface exhaustion. The interesting thing for me is that there are these little bits of skeuomorphism that, that are left over in Mavericks that Apple didn't quite excise, like Game Center. Game Center is still the ugly felt table um, that, that we saw uh, in iOS 6. Uh, it's the same Better way in OS lied. They haven't run out of green felt. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, they managed to find some more virtual green felt to abuse um, in, in this new version of OS X. Having said that, things like um, uh, the calendar app have been reworked to look uh, uh, more iOS 7-like. So I think Apple has kind of patched Mavericks where it feels like it really needed to, but maybe either didn't have the time, didn't have the resources, or just didn't feel it was that important. Um, to, to get both operating systems in lockstep with one another visually. So now where they did spend some time, uh, one of them at least, was in bringing I, iBooks to the Mac. There were rumors that Apple had thought about doing this for a while, but some people in the company were against it. But finally, you know, if you buy an iBook on the iPad or the iPhone, you can now read it on your Mac. And I actually find the experience really enjoyable. 
That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, iBooks is great on the Macintosh because um, you know you're you're dealing with, especially if you're dealing with like a nice iMac or you know a, a Mac connected to an external display. You're 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 or you know even uh, you know a, a a good laptop. You're dealing with. Um, a, a lot of surface area um, for you to lay your book out on, and you can do some neat things in iBooks on the Mac that you can't do um, in iBooks in uh, um, in, uh, in 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 uh, in iOS. You know, you can, uh, for example, um, you can have multiple books open simultaneously. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you're like using this as a student and you need to compare and contrast let's say a book that you're reading for class versus uh, a textbook that's giving you some kind of context you can do that um, the a notes pane runs along one edge of the page uh, which makes it a lot easier to annotate the stuff that you're working with so there are some nice embellishments um, to iBooks that I think make it um, uh, a, a little more user-friendly on the Mac than it is even on an iPad yeah, I think absolutely for people who want to do more, I, I, I always hesitate to call it power user features, but for people who want those multiple windows going on, my only pet peeve, and I understand it architecturally, but just from a usability standpoint, is that PDFs aren't as integrated as they are on iOS. If you if you try to open one, I mean, you can, you can organize them there, but if you try to open one, your old friend preview pops up again, and that's a bit of a disconnect from iBooks. Yeah, that's true. However, you know, it's it's worth noting that um, uh, iBooks does let you import EPUB uh, books yep. as well. So if you um, are are don't want to be enslaved to Apple's um, closed ecosystem, heaven forfend, uh, on books, but you'd like to use the iBook software um, to read EPUB books, which is more of an open format. I know I've got gotten a lot of sci-fi mm -hmm. um, in EPUB format over the years. Then uh, you can do that on iBooks too. Yeah, absolutely. There is there are thousands. Uh, I mean, the Project Gutenberg library overfloweth with thousands of. Um, I forget what the right term is. Not copyrighted. Ex whatever the free something or others uh, <laughs> titles you can explore. Maps has also gone to Mavericks. It started off in iOS. It had a bit of a troubled birth. Um, Apple. Apple basically made their own apps program, but there was a lot of data problems to begin with. Some of those have been fixed. It still looks like they need to put a lot more feet on the ground to actually, you know, this is the entrance to the shopping center. We'll get you there, and we'll also get you inside. Mm. Uh, but the interface looks and works great. Like It's no worse on the Mac than it is on iOS, which I guess is damning with faint praise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Maps is an important addition to, um, uh, to OS X. If for no other reason, then, you know, it was a little bit of a jarring user experience. If you were on your Mac and trying to figure out uh, what your calendar would be, because uh, to be perfectly frank with you, Renee, I prefer to work um, on my uh, calendar on my laptop than I do um, navigating it on iOS 7 still, despite the many uh, user interface changes and enhancements Apple made in iOS 7. I still think it's a fundamentally better user experience on the Mac. Um, y you can get you know, kind of confused going back and forth from an iOS 7 device to a Mac. So it's nice having it all there. One thing I really appreciate about Maps, and one thing that I think is a really clear hallmark of what Apple is trying to do, not only with Mavericks, but also moving forward with OS 10, is really clear integration. Um, not only app-to-app -app integration, but um, OS 10 to iOS 7 integration, wherever it makes sense. And Maps is one case where it really made a lot of sense to, to, to get that integration um, as tightly as possible. So um, if you add a map um, to your bookmarks list, for example, that's synchronized through iCloud between OS 10 and your iOS devices. Um, there are other things as well. One of the things, one of the features of Maps I love is that if you um, enter an address um, in uh, um, a, a calendar item, and this is still kind of this is a, this works a little sketchily. I haven't had 100% success with it, but when it, when it works, I'm always really pleased with it. Um, if you enter an address for a location in ma in in in, uh, in calendar. Um, it will actually pull it up in Maps, and it will show you where you where you go. And then uh, the calendar app will actually um, uh, allow you to pad your transportation time um, uh, ba based on what Maps is telling. Uh, 
the, uh, telling it the, the distance is. Yeah, and I the think, traffic conditions, which are nice. And the traffic conditions, which are nice. There, there are some issues there, which I'll get to later, but um, uh, the bottom line is it's all about making your life easier. It's all about making you more efficient and more productive, and I think that that's great. That's exactly what we want these apps to do. So the one thing for me, and I understand, you know, and people find it ridiculous when I say this, but Apple is a resource-constrained company. Yes, they're one of the richest companies in the world. Yes, they have thousands of employees. But the fact remains that if you task an employee to do one thing, that employee, by definition, cannot do something else. Um, and, you know, the competition for engineers is fierce, and Apple just can't get enough people. So uh, when I say this, it's not to criticize them, but the one missing piece for me is now maps in the iCloud, the way we have iWork in um, iCloud. So I can go from iOS to any browser to the Mac and back. On maps, I can go from iOS and I can go on the Mac, but that web piece is missing and you notice it mostly when you try to share, for example. Uh, on the Mac, it'll give you a PDF containing directions or a graphic image. Um, and I think in some cases, if it does give you a link, it boots you over to Google Maps in a worst case um, scenario. So I have to imagine somewhere deep inside Cupertino, there is a Maps in the iCloud project that we will see one day. You know, that would be really interesting to see. Uh, I'm not sure where the utility would be in having maps on all three platforms, but, um, uh, you know, if, if it's a st strategic um, I think just for sharing. It. Right, okay, all right. Yeah, maps with some limited functionality anyway on the web would be nice for sure. Yeah. Um, you, said you, want, you said you had one last thing to say about maps, Peter? Uh, no, 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 no. I've got a okay. criticism about calendar. Um, ah, okay. All right. So we'll get there. Um, so, yeah, speaking of calendar, it 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 is no longer as skeuomorphic. It is much cleaner. Uh, I find entering stuff a little bit easier. Um, oh, actually, Renee, you know what? Yes. There was one more thing, and it wasn't because of anything I said before, but there is one more thing I want to add about Maps. Sure. Um, Apple has published a MapKit API, or Application Programming Interface for Developers. Um, so uh, although you know we're seeing kind of limited functionality right now, I think in the coming months you're going to see a lot, new, a lot of new... Um, apps appear uh, for the Mac that incorporate map support. I'm sure, for example, third calendar uh, or third-party calendar developers um, are working very hard on getting map support uh, built into their apps as well. Um, so we will be seeing more of um, uh, the the Maps app in other places um, from from other companies on OS 10 going forward. Anyway, let's, let's move on. We'll see Fantastical with Mapnificent. Magnificent. Ooh, that's nice. You should tell Michael Simmons about that. I am going to. Uh, after I reach the domain name. No, I'm just there kidding. There we go. Yeah. Um, all right, so Calendar. What's your beef with Calendar, Peter? Well, you know, Calendar actually is very nice overall. I like the I like the redesign of it. I like the um, iOSification of it, for lack of a better word. I think that the, um, the, the flat, minimal um, design for, uh, uh, for Calendar... Um, uh, works well, and I also like the fact that you can just kind of scroll through with a swipe. It's very nice. Uh, but you know, getting back to um, the the integration that I was talking about with Maps for a second, uh, uh, a few moments ago, one thing that I dislike about it is, um, and this is, I, I you know, I'm not exactly sure whether or not my val my my complaint is valid here, but. Um, Maps and calendar, the way that they work together, they're always going to um, give you your travel time based on uh, your current location. Mm -hmm. So if I'm creating a complicated calendar for, let's say, an event like y you and me at WWDC or... Um, or you uh, at Comic-Con. <laughs> Whatever, right, exactly. Um, the assumption is that I need to make travel time based on what my location is right then instead of where my last appointment was, which is what I often end up doing. Um, I, I would love to see a, a little more flexibility here um, between maps and, and calendar to sort of intelligently figure out where I am at that particular point and then make that assumption uh, about travel time, it it kind of it, it it makes me have to calculate it myself, which isn't bad. I'm still happy to have the feature, um, but that's I'd why like you got a computer. But you know, I'd like to see a little more intelligence. Exactly, I'd like to see a little more assistance there. No, no, I think that's absolutely true. Um, 
The the other thing I hate is Facebook integration. Oh my god, Facebook integration in Calendar is a nightmare. It was like that on iOS too. And the first thing I I do is I wait as long as possible to ever give my login, my Facebook login to iOS uh, or to OS 10, and then immediately I turn off birthdays and events. Yeah. I don't need people. The, the problem is actually one of the biggest problems on Facebook side because they have this stupid invite all button that people see. I'm having a barbecue on a different continent. Invite all. What do you? Why? Right, exactly. Not only that, but like um, events that span mul multiple days will actually take up like a you know, forty-eight, seventy-two hour block on your calendar because um, the the granularity of Facebook events isn't tight enough to say you know it, it's only happening from ten to six on these days. Um, so yeah, you know it's just it's sloppy, it's ugly. I don't use it, and I don't see why anybody with any sense would. Kill it by fire. Kill it, yeah, exactly. Kill it with fire. So one of my favorite new features, and one that I'm extremely jealous got to OS X before it got to iOS, is actionable notifications, which I think Apple calls interactive notifications. And I am using this a ton. I'm sitting at my computer, and iMessage comes in. I do not even have to open messages. I can just hit the reply button, type my reply in line, send, and boom, it's gone. I love this. Absolutely, gosh. You know, I didn't even realize this This feature kind of snuck up on me insidiously. I mean, I knew about the feature, but I didn't really know how much I was going to use it until I actually really started using it. Um, and it's very cool. Uh, you know, what basically happens, what happens in, or what happened in Mountain Lion and uh, what was that you would get a notification, but it wouldn't be actionable. So you would be alerted that you got a new email, you would be alerted that you got a new tweet, but uh, you would have to go to those specific applications in order to respond. Like you still do on iOS like an animal. Like you do exactly on iOS. So um, the way that it works now is that you know, and that you get a nice little notification pop up in the upper right hand corner of your screen um, and uh, you'll get some context for it. You'll see maybe the subject line of the email um, or uh, a, a, a section of the tweet and you can respond right away. Um, or, you know, you can also click on it and be brought to that application so you can respond um, in more depth. Uh, but it, it is, it is a, a, a terrific um, productivity enhancer, and it's just it's a hallmark of what Apple is trying to do with, with Mavericks, as I've been saying. Now, uh, you can you still swipe sideways to get notifications entered, just like you did in Mountain Lion. Uh, and actually, the tweet and Facebook post buttons are still there, which were you know ripped out of iOS to the consternation of many. But there's also a messages button there. So you can just you can open notification center, tap the messages button, and in line, just start a new message as well. I'm still not convinced that those kinds of buttons should be a notification center. That, to me, is more of a control center type thing, which isn't on OS X Mavericks yet. But I, I still do like the idea of Apple pulling this functionality out and sort of making it not headless, but sort of making it modular. And a, a, I like the idea of it being where I want to go and not where I am, and not where I have to go to find it. Yeah, I mean, it makes it easier to um, to stay in touch with all the people um, or, or resources that you feel are important. You can tweet, you can message, um, you can connect through Facebook, you can even post on LinkedIn, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of functionality there, um, and it, it, it certainly um, helps somebody who's working on a Mac stop from being distracted uh, by, you know, sort of going down the social media rabbit hole whenever they want to announce something or whenever they want to uh, post something real quick. So um, uh, hopefully it'll, it'll keep people a little bit more on task. And one of the nice things is that the social media sites are often some of the most Ajax or Web 2.0 or JavaScript, whatever language you want to use, intensive websites. And we'll get to why that matters later, but that you don't have to launch a browser with the demands a browser has plus all the demands that JavaScript throw at it is a win just in terms of managing all the resources of your computer as well. Absolutely. The Messages app is very similar to me, like to, to Mountain Lion. It still has both iMessage capability and legacy stuff like AIM or Jabber um, thrown into it. I still like that, Peter. I still wish I could access more than just iMessage and SMS in Messages on iOS. Uh, and that Apple is keeping that around in Mavericks gives me a little bit of hope uh, for a, a unified messaging app future. 
Yeah, you know, they do a pretty good job. They um, they integrate Google Messaging, they integrate Yahoo Messaging, AOL. Uh, you know, my I've had an AOL, I've I've had an AIM account since long before I had a. Uh, um, a, uh, a, a, a an iChat account, so that's how most people reach me. Um, and you could do other message accounts as well, like you were saying, Jabber, for example, uh, which I know that uh, um, gets used by um, a certain segment of of, uh, of of companies and corporations who want to have an internal messaging system. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are all great ways um, that sort of ex extend and expand uh, that that functionality in messages. Um, uh, you know, plus there's the whole uh, iOS to OS 10 aspect to it too which is very important. Now, Safari which to me is always since it was introduced has become one of the most central apps in OS 10 and iOS both uh, because the web has become a platform unto itself and Apple did something interesting so a while ago Chrome came out and they decided to split off processes so if you had flash crash in one tab it wouldn't take down your whole browser and for whatever reason they did not want to share that back with WebKit so WebKit decided to make this new multi-threaded engine and it wasn't quite as good as what Chrome was doing because it would separate out the process but not the tab and now WebKit has gone back and done sort of what Chrome did and actually uh, jail each of those threads separately and that combined with a lot of other performance enhancements has made Maverick's Safari I think the most stable Safari in quite a while. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they've they've uh, totally reworked the way that JavaScript works um, on Safari, for example, which has really um, uh, improved it. And one place where Safari absolutely absolutely beats Chrome hands down um, is in uh, memory efficiency. It's much more memory efficient. Uh, it has has a lower footprint on memory than um, than Chrome does, which is great for users, especially of laptops like MacBook Airs, where they may have much more limited amounts of physical. RAM installed uh, than on some other systems. Um, that that also means that Safari works more efficiently with the CPU, which equates to better battery life. And again, this is one of the hallmarks of Mavericks, where Apple is looking, it's leaving no stone unturned when it comes to trying to save cycles, when it comes to trying to save uh, milliwatts here and there, so your batteries will last longer and you will be able to get more life um, out of each charge. Yeah, I mean, Safari web content under Maverick, uh, under L Mountain Lion was the bane of my existence because it would just grow and grow and grow in terms of resource. And now you actually get a split of all the different ones that are spawned. It's no longer this monolithic thing, which I think is great. The developer tools, they, you know, the new WebKit versions of those are very nice. But the user-facing features I like a lot too. For example, shared links will pull in any associated Twitter account and give you a reading list style pull of just the links contained in them and it gives you that continuous reading experience that you get with reading list as well. This is true and uh, you know that feature is optional you can make that sidebar go away and then um, it, it doesn't sort of get in your line of sight but if you want it there it's there. Uh, they've also pulled that um, uh, I guess sort of fake 3D gallery look for um, top sites um, in, in Safari they've replaced it with a flatter um, uh, look that I think is more complementary to, for example, iOS 7. Um, you can add sites uh, uh, from your bookmarks and you can arrange top, rearrange top sites as well uh, just by um, clicking on the thumbnails and dragging them around. So, uh, you know, Apple's made some mild interface adjustments to Safari, but they've made some important ones that I think are really going to translate into better usability for people uh, going forward. Now, one of the big new additions and it's so big that it actually gets its own bullet point is iCloud Keychain and on the surface this sounds really interesting basically Safari will generate strong-ish passwords, they're not super strong but they're stronger than most people use it will record them and manage them for you and then autofill them back into sites and it'll sync those between any of your Macs and any of your iOS devices and I know Ali had a rant about this and we'll get to that the immediate thing for me though was that there doesn't seem to be a master password mechanism and I use that a lot for example if I log into my Mac and then I give it to a friend to use I'm okay with him using it but I don't necessarily want him to be able to autofill my 
passwords and credit cards. Yeah, that's right. Um, it, it, in terms of uh, basic authentication, when you're authenticating a new device for iCloud uh, Keychain, it's all linked. Um, th there's kind of a, there, there's kind of a two-step process, a two-step verification process. Um, you you have to link it um, using your Apple ID at first, your Apple ID password and and your Apple ID username, and then you also need to verify it uh, from another machine that's already a trusted machine using iCloud Keychain. Um, so, uh, for example, if I add my iPhone to my iCloud Keychain group, um, I get a message on my Mac, which is already um, blessed by iCloud Keychain, saying, hey, um, this device is asking for uh, verification. Do you want to give it? Once that's done, uh, the, and, and, you know, again, this is the two-step, the, the classic two-step verification. It's something you have um, and something you know. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's sending a message to your Mac, which you have, and it's... it's uh, um, asking you something you know, which is your Apple ID password. Um, so uh, nice to see two-step authentication there. Um, I'm, I'm happy for that. But yeah, no, I understand what you're saying, Renee. One thing that's really interesting is that Apple will, or that, that OS X Mavericks will heavily prompt you um, to lock down your machine uh, with a password uh, that needs to be entered um, when waking from sleep if you use iCloud Keychain. Um, and this is just another way of making sure that, um, your, that, that uh, your, your trust in iCloud Keychain isn't abused, that you are who you say you are. Now, Ali's beef was, and I, I can see both sides of this. Her thing is she generates a password on her iPhone. She goes home to her Mac. She sits down in front of Chrome for who knows what reason. Um, you know, everyone has their eccentricities. That's fine. Uh, and that password is then not available. Or, for example, if she goes to an office uh, because she, you know, she was, used to work as an accountant and they have Windows installed and she needs to get to a password, it's simply not available. And because she generated it and it's not something she remembers, she then has to go in and try and recover cover that password. So yeah, ahead. and it's, it's, it's worth noting that as far as I know right now, iCloud Keychain is only between iOS and OS X. So even if you have iCloud software installed, the, the iCloud um, control panel installed in Windows and uh, Safari installed in Windows, I don't think that uh, iCloud Keychain works on Windows computers at all. Yeah, I don't think so either. And I, I do think you can go into settings and, and, and recover the password and type it in manually. Sure, yeah, no, absolutely. But that kind of thing is depending on your workflow. So if you're all in, if you use Safari on your Mac and you use um, Saf iOS and that's it, um, and you don't really you know, give your devices or your computers to other people to use, it is absolutely fantastic. You cannot beat first-party integration, but if you need any of those other things, I think you still might want to stick to 1Password or LastPass or something. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are third-party solutions out there that may be a little bit more flexible for your particular needs, so take a look figure it out based on what you're doing as to what the best solution is going to be. So... Multiple displays, talking about best solutions, this did not work great previously. Uh, you would either be stuck on one screen, and then I think Mountain Lion let you, f you know, have freedom of which screen you chose, but the secondary screen would go linen, uh, and nobody needs that much linen. Seamstresses do not need that much linen. But Mavericks, in all of my tests so far, it works... There's a few eccentricities. The dock does bounce around a little bit. Uh, it's got a little bit of jazz to it. But you can have full screen apps on any window you want, on multiple windows. You can have the dock and the menu show up where you need it to show up. And it looks like this is a problem that they have nailed. Yeah, this is a problem that they have nailed. And their way of handling it, I think, was, was really creative. What they've basically done is that they've made... Um, and you know it's funny because multiple monitor support is something that Apple has had since since time immemorial. I mean, we are talking way, way back in the beige Mac days. You know, iOS. Uh, I mean, uh, Mac uh, uh, Mac OS what seven? Right? You know, you could do multiple displays um, at least. Uh, System since seven. Dinosaurs tapped on mice. I know exactly since you know since at least System Seven. So um, uh, you know it's something that's been around for a very long time, and it's something that that for a very long time uh, wasn't necessarily unique to Max, but that Max did a lot better than PCs did. And when Lion came out uh, in 2011, things kind of backslid a little bit um, because Lion introduced these these. Uh, this full screen app support and full screen app really messed full screen apps really messed up um, 
uh, the way that multiple monitors work, because as you said, if you went full screen on on uh, in in an app on one screen, the other screen would be rendered useless. You would just so get a linen, linen. You would just get a linen background, and it's like, well, what the hell is this? Um, the the way that Apple worked around it in uh, in in uh, Mavericks is pretty creative. What they've basically done is um, uh, each monitor that's connected to your computer is basically considered a separate instance of uh, a space. Uh, spaces are, of course, virtual desktops in OS X. They've been around for a while now. Um, and they, they let you, you know, organize your workspace however you want. So if you want certain applications in one space or, um, uh, you know, a clean desktop in another to be able to find apps, um, you can arrange spaces however you want. And it's a great, great productivity and e enhancement tool, um, especially on laptops where you might be working with really limited desktop real estate. But you mm -hmm. might need really complex layouts depending on which apps you're using. I mean, you know, Photoshop, for example, you know, it's going to have all these menus uh, and palettes that uh, you're going to need access to. Or you might want a screen with your web development, like your text editor, your FTP program, all that stuff combined. Exactly, and then another screen with your web browser on it, for example, so as you're prototyping, you can actually see how your page is going to look. Um, so this is all great, but what Apple's done with uh, Mavericks is that they've made each um, uh, display its own space by default. Uh, this has led to some idiosyncrasies, as you were saying, like, you know, the dock kind of hops around and you don't necessarily know where it is. And some people find the menu um, available on each screen to be a little bit jarring and, and confusing um, the way that it works. Uh, the one complaint that I've heard more than any other, though, from people who are using multiple displays don't quite get how it works, is that if you try to span um, a, uh, a window... Uh, in an application from one screen to another, you can't do it. You yeah. can drag the window halfway there, and then it'll just snap back to the first uh, the first screen. You used again. to be able to do that, but because it's now spaces and not actually desktops, it's changed its behavior. Aha! Uh -huh. But I'm going to give you and the re and our viewers and listeners a special tip. If you don't want it to do that, all you have to do is go into Mission Control and uncheck Displays Have Separate Spaces. It'll work just like it used to in Mountain Lion with all the limitations therein. But at least if that was the big thing, if you needed to be able to span um, uh, a, a window across two monitors. If you, you were Craig Hockenberry and you had two monitors side by side vertically, you can now go back to that. That's exactly right. You know, Actually, I do have two monitors stacked side by side or stacked on top of one another. Uh, my MacBook Air um, is, is sort of positioned right underneath a 20-inch uh, a display, and it actually makes a lot more sense to just, you know, stack it like that. Um, so, it, it, and it works, it works. I mean, if you uncheck displays, have separate spaces, then you can span windows and everything because it's just one big virtual desktop, one sort of oddly, you know, shaped virtual desktop, but a virtual desktop nonetheless. Um, having said that, I think that, um, that, that multiple displays um, in Mavericks works leaps and bounds better uh, than it ever did in Mountain Lion or better than it ever did in Lion. One thing that I think is really cool, by the way, is even if you have a couple of displays hooked up to your computer, if you're still running out of space and you happen to, happen to, happen to have an Apple TV around, you can use that Apple TV as a third desktop, which I think is very cool. So, I mean, mutual friend Guy English at one point was sing almost single-handedly taking on the entire Mac universe by stating that he liked the way Microsoft handled menus in Windows because given the multi-window the multi -window environment, having a menu associated with an application was not a bad thing. And, of course, the traditional Mac thing was that the menu would become whatever the most forward window is. And I think multiple displays slash spaces in OS X is actually a really good compromise because you don't have to have a, a single application dominating the entire menu stack, um, no matter what window you're in, but don't have the excess Chrome on every separate instance of an application on your screen. So I'm okay with the balance that they've struck. Yeah, absolutely. So now that we've finished the Surface stuff, we can dig into the really cool stuff, which is the guts of Mavericks. And there is so much here to love, Peter. There is timer coalescence. There is compressed memory. Um, all of this stuff, which is not really user-facing and will probably get ignored and or, you know, glossed over. Uh, for example, I have a 2012 uh, MacBook Pro that was getting maybe three hours of battery life. I installed Mavericks on it, five hours of battery life. Easily, yeah. Yeah. It's 
it's ridiculous. So uh, tell me if I'm not correct about any of this stuff, but as far as I understand, things like timer coalescence, for example, uh, it stops the CPU. For, the CPU has this thing called race to sleep. When any time a task can be done quickly, the CPU can power down and it can save battery life. But if you have a bunch of different tasks going off randomly, the CPU never gets to sleep. So as much as possible, Mavericks tries to delay and or coordinate these things so that they happen in small uh, stacked blocks and then the CPU can handle them, go back to sleep, and you get a much more efficient power curve overall. Yeah, and the dirty little secret here is that timer coalescing is something that's been around on Windows for quite a while, and only now is OS X getting it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> having said that, I'm very happy to see it happen because it is definitely a big, uh, um, a, a big uh, energy saver, and uh, it's virtually invisible to the user. You don't notice any changes in the way that your Mac performs um, or the way that it acts. It's just using um, what the CPU can do much more efficiently than than ever before. The other, and uh, compressed memory, and I was, I was having a discussion about this with an IT friend of mine, Anthony, uh, is really interesting to me as well. So previously, uh, I mean, swapping is an incredibly expensive operation because you're writing RAM to disk and then pulling it back, and that uses a lot of energy and it's not as fast. Um, but when you start running out of RAM, that's what used to happen. And now what iOS does, sorry, what OS X does, it starts to compress memory. And because compress is CPU bound and not IO bound, it is a less expensive operation. So as more applications, you, you fire up Photoshop, you fire up Final Cut Pro, you start running low on memory, it will compress the memory that's being used. And yes, there is some overhead, but it stops you having to hit swap um, so early. The only downside that we could think of is that when you do hit that wall, now you have to deal with both CPU overhead for the compression and I.O. overhead, so it's sort of like you're really hitting that wall when you do hit it, but you've pushed it so far down that hopefully you don't hit it as often. Yeah, and let's face it, as Apple's moving to more solid state storage, you know, on MacBook Airs, on MacBook Pros with Retina displays, on the new Mac Pro, um, even in the Fusion drives on the iMac, uh, the, the effects of swap are a little... Uh, ameliorated, I guess you could say, because um, you know it's it, it, it's it's writing that out to a much faster uh, mechanism uh, for writing and reading it, namely solid state drive, um, than it would be um, uh, if it was writing it out to you know a you know clunky old hard drive. Having said that, there's still a bottleneck there because you know that's that's a different. Uh, um, uh, that's a different bus interface altogether. Um, it's it's not uh, nearly as tightly integrated as the system's internal RAM is concerned. One thing that I've noticed that's really kind of interesting about memory compression, or the way that um, Mavericks handles memory, um, just in general, is that if I actually take a look at the memory usage, let's say on uh, my Mac Pro or my MacBook Pro with Retina display, both of which have a fair amount. My Mac Pro has 12 gigs. My MacBook Pro with Retina display has 16. What I notice is that at any given time, compared to the way things used to be, Apple uh, or uh, Mavericks has grabbed a much bigger chunk of active memory uh, than it used to. So if if it sees that there's memory available, it'll put it to good use. Um, it'll good use as soon as it can um, instead of leaving it on the table and then all of a sudden letting things get out of control at the last second um, and but if you actually take a look at the way that it's 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 using it um, it, 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 it handles it much more effectively in terms of what it's doing with inactive memory, in terms of what it's doing with free memory. And how it juggles the GPU now, I think, is much more dynamic. And how it juggles the GPU as well, although that's not directly related to memory uh, uh, compression. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on under the hood here that I think uh, makes a, makes really good sense uh, for, for what... Um, uh, uh, what we're doing, and you know, we're we're dealing with with more machines that have uh, somewhat limited amounts of memory. I mean, you know, MacBook uh, MacBook Airs, as I was saying before, you know, they come with four gigs now. It's not a terrific, not a tremendous amount when you're talking about the actual footprint um, of 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 Mavericks itself. But people are expecting to do more with it. You know, I mean, the same software runs on a Mac Mini that runs on a Mac Pro. Right, you can do all the same things with a MacBook Pro 
a 13-inch MacBook Pro that you can do with a 27-inch iMac. Um, it's just a question of what sort of performance you're going to see. And Apple really needed to uh, make that as scalable as possible. So all this under the hood stuff uh, in Mavericks is what makes a big difference. So my favorite, my absolute favorite of these new features is the menu of shame. <laughs> so you have the battery indicator doesn't just tell you how much battery is left, it tells you who are being bad battery citizens. Uh, and it's my understanding some companies thought this would never ever ship. Well guess what? It shipped. It wasn't just meant to scare you, it was literally meant to shame you. Uh, you know, and, and Safari can appear in there, so Apple's dog fooding this themselves, but if your app is not great at managing your energy resources, your users are going to know it. Um, and I think that is an amazingly user-friendly tool for them to include. Exactly. And it'll be interesting to see going forward um, how developers can explain this when uh, their users catch on and start complaining about it. Uh, if you're not using a battery-powered Mac, but you're still kind of interested in uh, the effect that uh, the, the software that you're running has on the efficiency of the machine, all you have to do is open Activity Monitor, which is a utility that you'll find in the Utilities folder. Um, Apple has incorporated some new charts and graphs in there down at the bottom that I think are very interesting. Uh, activity monitor is broken up into a whole bunch of different tabs like CPU, memory, energy, disk, and network. And if you take a look at um, uh, uh, any one of them, you're going to see this little graph down at the bottom showing what you're doing. You know, how many packets you're sending on the network, what your disk I.O. is. Um, energy impact uh, will, will tell you uh, what sort of uh, uh, impact whatever you're doing is having on uh, the energy efficiency of the machine. Memory pressure likewise will give you a sense of uh, how your memory is being utilized overall. Um, and CPU load will likewise um, give you an idea of, of what's going on. It doesn't give you an idea, like it doesn't give you a lot of granularity, uh, but still if you want to see charts and graphs and pretty pictures it's kind of a fun thing. Yeah, and again, I've caught Safari and Mail.app in there, so it's it's by no means, you know, Chrome does not have a permanent location in that bar, nor does Photoshop or any, you know, Adobe application, but they're there too. Indeed. So, Peter, looking at it overall, um, Apple has switched to this yearly update cycle. They used to take, you know, 18 months or more to do an OS. Uh, they still tout 200 new features, which is their average go-to number. Some of them, you know, most people wouldn't notice. A few of them really are the big, you know, tentpole features that Federici spoke about. How do you feel about Mavericks, you know, compared to past updates and how it's moving the Mac platform forward? I think Mavericks is a leopard to snow leopard kind of change. It's, um, uh, you know, building incrementally, um, substantially, but incrementally on the foundation that was laid before it. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some problems. You know, if you just Google Mavericks issues or Mavericks problems, you're going to be inundated with thousands of web pages already. Mail doesn't uh, play nicely with Gmail. No, that is a complete horror show, and I'm not sure what the hell is going to have to happen to fix it. Um, although Joe Kissel over at Tidbits um, is is the the mentat when it comes to that stuff, um, you know. But there there is a, a you know there, so there are a few rough edges that Apple's going to have to work out. Um, Overall, though, I am very happy with Mavericks as an overall upgrade. I haven't run into any showstoppers in terms of compatibility issues. All I've noticed is improved battery life, um, faster waking from sleep, and some improved efficiencies um, on my laptops, which are very, very important to me. Uh, so if Mavericks helps make me a more efficient uh, and more productive user, I'm all in favor of it, and I think it's a great upgrade. Yeah, and I, I forget if it was you who said this or Syracuse or somebody else, but if you're in that coffee shop and your laptop is ticking down in battery, how much is an extra hour, an extra hour and a half worth to you? It can be absolutely invaluable if you're traveling, if you're on an airplane, whether it's you know work or just something you're working on for the family. The, the change in battery life to me um, is not one of those sexy forward-facing user features that will sell an operating system, but it's something that everyone using it will appreciate when they get it. And I think that, to me, is the hallmark feature. 
You know, I, uh, on the subject of battery life, I, I, the way that I'm looking at it is that historically, if you've wanted to improve battery life on your laptop, you've had two choices. You can either try to find a higher capacity battery and replace it with that. That's what we used to do in the bad old days. Uh, you know, I remember with my Pismo uh, uh, PowerBook G3, the old black PowerBook G3s um, that had the modular sides that, that you could pop out. I remember um, uh, replacing um, uh, the battery with a high Third, uh, third party uh, or the highest capacity third party battery I could find uh, because I just wanted to eke an extra half hour, maybe an extra hour um, out, out of my battery life. And then, you know, more recently, well, you've been able to trade in your old crusty uh, MacBook or MacBook Pro for a MacBook Air. And, you know, especially when the new Haswell machines came out this year, we saw a big jump in battery efficiency that was great. Now, with Mavericks, you can for free install software from Apple, which will improve. Uh, your max battery life. Now, if your laptop has a sketchy battery that needs to be replaced anyway, you're not going to see any improvements with Mavericks. Get thyself to uh, an Apple service center and get your battery replaced, or do it yourself if you're handy. Um, but if, if your machine is working within tolerances, if it's working within uh, factory spec, uh, if you install Mavericks, you are going to see an improvement to battery life. And as you were saying, Renee, I think that's incredibly valuable uh, to anybody who's working on deadline, anybody who's trying to get work done, uh, even somebody who's just trying to get pictures um, edited and uploaded uh, to photo stream so grandma and grandpa can see the kid's latest recital. Uh, all these things, you know, are, 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 are wonderful to have uh, when you're dealing with improved efficiencies. But when you factor that into the other improved efficiencies and workflows that are actually present in user-facing features in Mavericks, things like Maps, things like uh, Tab Finder uh, Windows, things like tagging, which we didn't talk about, yeah. uh, which I think is great, uh, which help you organize files regardless of where they actually are on your hard drive. Um, you know, these are to help uh, users get the most out of their system. And, and from that perspective, I think uh, Mavericks is, 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 is a home run. Now, is there anyone you would recommend not upgrade? For example, I waited six months before I upgraded my Mac Pro production machine to... Um, to Mountain Lion because there were a couple apps that sort of didn't update fast enough where I wanted to make sure it was rock solid. If you're, for example, an editor at iMore who's still running Snow Leopard on one of her Mac Pro, MacBook Pros and Lion on her Air and is hesitating, um, is there anyone who should wait? Still, or has this gotten to the point where you can upgrade without worrying? You know, I think that there are a few edge cases out there. Um, I, I have a two gigabyte MacBook Pro, a MacBook Air, for example, kind of an edge case. You know, two gigs is just a little too much, too small of a footprint uh, for. Um, uh, for Mavericks. I did upgrade it to Mavericks. I'm not real happy with it. It's an edge case kind of like an iPhone 4 uh, or an iPad 2 with iOS 7. It runs, but it doesn't run spectacularly well. Um, that that I, I you know that might that might be a good case to stick with Mountain Lion for now, um, at least you know for a while until some efficiencies get ironed out there. Um, in other cases, you know if you've got a real custom workflow, I've heard of some uh, you know weird stuff from like Oracle and so on, not working right under Mavericks. Uh, you may want to take a back seat and make sure to check with the vendors of the specific products that you depend on to make sure that they work well with Fav with with Mavericks. Um, and finally, um, uh, whatever you do, whether you upgrade to Mavericks um, or not, back up your machine. You know, whatever you do, don't try to install Mavericks unless you've got a, a, a hard drive um, or a, uh, um, a, a time capsule uh, that you're going to be able to recover from in the event that anything goes heinously wrong. Yeah. Um, so, you know, please make sure to back up before you do anything. I, I back up to a time <coughs> capsule. I make a clone with Super Duper. Canadian bandwidth does not allow me to use an online backup, but my documents folder is in Dropbox, which is, you know, just enough to make sure that everything really important is taken care of. And I did have one bad backup, and I recovered, and I, sorry, one bad upgrade once, and I did recover, and I went on. But I, I cannot stress what Peter said enough. Back yourself up. No excuse not to, seriously. All right, Peter, you're doing a great job covering Mavericks. Ali's posting a bunch of how-tos at imore.com slash tips. Um, if people want to find out more about your Mavericks, you want to read more of your Mavericks writing or find out more about you, where can they go? imore.com. 
And you're on Flar the Twitter. Yes, all right, Flarg at Twitter, uh, F-L-A-R-G-H on Twitter. Very nice. You can find me at Rene Ritchie. You can find me at imore.com as well. And for all of our shows, including Debug for Developers, Iterate for Designers, Vector for, you know, what's happening in the industry today, you can just go to mobilenations.com. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy Mavericks. Let us know what you think about it. Peter's review is still in the featured block on top of imore.com. Go there, read it, leave a comment. We want to know what you think. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, man.